my loves and welcome back to the Horus Heresy and welcome to yet another divergence in this series. You find a lot of these scattered throughout the series. The, the thing about the Horus Heresy is it is such an expansive setting. It's such an expansive era. I mean, the war that is the Horus Heresy is not just one war. It's a, it's a, 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 a compilation of various skirmishes and... Um, encounters and genocides and all sorts of things happening behind the scenes. There's a lot, there's potentially infinite stories to tell. I mean, later on, we're going to be getting onto the Kalth portion of the series, and that takes forever. That's It's enormous. It spans several books, short story collections. It's absolutely enormous. After that, you've got the Unremembered Empire, which is an entirely new uh, section of the Horus Heresy that's never been explored before, but which again, covers several different volumes really interesting stuff so as a result of that expansiveness you don't just have novels in order to show you some of the smaller encounters or to to lend spice or detail to the larger more significant situations you have these anthologies of short story collections now tales of heresy is the first one in that series it's um it's one of those books whereby there's a lot of good stories here. There's a lot of interesting tales here, a lot of well-written tales. But the raw fact of the matter is, if you're going for the main story, if you're going for the main thrust of the Horus Heresy, if you just want the straight narrative from Horus Rising to the Siege of Terror, you can largely miss this one out. That that isn't to say that the stories here aren't significant. They are. They're fun. They're good. They're well put together. They're largely well written stories, but they are also largely incidental stories. By and large, you can miss this entire collection, and you will miss nothing. You can skip directly to the next book in the series, and you'll have missed nothing. These are. They're more like diversions or distractions from the main story that just lend it a little bit more texture, that lends it a little bit more spice. So, how you engage with these quite frequent anthologies that crop up every now and then that sort of punctuate the main flow of the Horus Heresy. It depends on what you want from it, how whether you engage with them at all. I mean, there's a couple of stories that you absolutely have to read in these short story volumes. Like, uh, there's one coming later, not in this collection, but in a later collection called uh, The Reflection Cracked, which is, of course, a reference to Oscar Wilde. And you absolutely have to read that one because it's a... It's, um, it's key to events that happen later. Here, the vast, vast majority are fun, well-written, but largely incidental. Uh, the title story, Blood Games by Dan Abnett. Now, of course, Dan Abnett is an inveterate writer. He has been writing in this, uh, in this arena, in this mythology for years. And, of course, he wrote Horus Rising. So this series really was determined. The thrust and the themes and the nature of this series was defined by him. He wrote Horus Rising, the first book in the series. So you'd expect any story by him to be quite good. And Blood Games is fine. There's nothing particularly wrong with it. It's a really well-written, punchy story. What's really interesting about it is you get a look at terror for the first time. I mean, you actually get this intimate, in-depth look at terror. And not only that, but how certain military structures and chambers and processes work on terror how the politics of terror works it's from the perspective of an actual custodian so one of the emperor's own custodians um so you get an in-depth look into how they operate with reference to the emperor and to what's happening in the uh, the wider metaphysics of this universe so it's good it's very well written it's very interesting but is it important is it one that you need to read absolutely not absolutely not the same is true of the next one wolf at the door by mike lee uh it's a good bit of action involving the space wolves but that's about it it's about it. There's the only thing that happens in Wolf at the Door, which is of significance, is you get to see 
a little bit of the corruption that will later claim the Space Wolves coming to the fore. So it's the th it focuses on the 13th company of the Space Wolves. So you know what that means. Those of you who know the Space Wolves know what that means. The 13th company are effectively damned. Is it, is it called the Canis Helix or something like that? That particular genetic flaw is going to claim them very, very soon, actually. When the, um, the invasion of Prospero occurs, that's when the Canis Helix erupts and when they start to become monsters. What I really like about this story is like a lot of the stories involving the Space Wolves. It exposes their hypocrisy. They condemn the Thousand Sons for harboring secrets, for not, not telling the wider Imperium about what they're doing, about what they're harboring, about their genetic corruption. The Space Wolves do exactly the same thing exactly the same thing. They do everything in their power, as do the Blood Angels. They do everything in their power to actually uh, conceal what's happening to them from the wider Imperium, because they're afraid of censure, because they're afraid of being condemned, in the same way that they condemn the Thousand Sons. There's a lot of that here. Um, they never come off well in this, in this entire series. I'm really sorry. The Space Wolves never come off well. No matter who writes them, no matter where they occur, the Space Wolves never come off well. Uh, Scions of the Storm by Anthony Reynolds. Now, this is a story involving the word bearers, and generally that would really appeal to me, but I am just not a fan of Anthony Reynolds' writing, I've got to say. Anthony Reynolds wrote the, um, the Word Bearers trilogy, which is a big old hefty chunk of writing, and I just don't like it. It just does nothing for me. It doesn't, I don't think it portrays the Word Bearers in any flattering light, or in any great complexity. Um, the writing, by and large, in this one is pretty bad. It's pretty damn bad. There's a lot of and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. That's how the writing is. There's no music to it. It just goes on like that. There's lo lots of run-on sentences, and it just, it, it, it actually makes you grind your teeth a little bit. Um, there are some interesting things here. It's about the word bearers just starting to discover the dark gods, just starting to discover the cultures that worship the dark gods and to become interested in them. So that's kind of fascinating, but it's just not for me. Um, I am just not a fan of the guy's writing. I much prefer the way Aaron Dembski Bowden tackles the word bearers later. Uh, just infinitely 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 more interested in that it's an okay story it's not that important if you've if you read the um Aaron Dembski Bowden books the first heretic or Relian, all of this information is in there anyway so you don't really need it to be perfectly honest uh the voice by James Swallow again you get this dip into the wider imperium here so you actually get to see the the black ships that are in are still in operation in the present day Imperium, the ships that are used to find psychers and take them to the Emperor's laboratories. They actually are st already in operation at this point in the Imperium's history. Now that's interesting. Uh, the Sisters of Silence kind of make their debut here as well. Um, this is where you see them for the first time and what they do uh, and how they operate. So that's kind of interesting. The Sisters of Silence will come to play a big part in the Horus Heresy because, of course, they fill in a gap. The Sisters of Silence fill in a gap. The Thousand Sons, the, you know, the reason Horus took pains to neutralize the Thousand Sons is because if the Thousand Sons had sided with the Emperor and had used their powers to their full capacity, they'd have wiped out Horus's legions with a click of their fingers the thousand sons are some of the one of the most powerful legions because they use incredible sorceries you know so the the sisters of silence plug that gap in the invasion of prospero whereby they act as a countermeasure to the thousand sons abilities without that prospero doesn't make much sense they'd have just used their sorceries to blast the space wolves to atoms you know so the sisters of silence are very important very very important and this story kind of introduces them uh again not essential at all call of the lion by gav thorpe uh again gav thorpe is not my favorite writer in the black library um i he's not 
he tries his best, but I find that Gav Thorpe's writing is kind of... It's kind of someone who got lucky. He used to write the rules books, yeah, for Games Workshop, and it seems like he's just sort of transposed that career into the Black Library, and I think it's more luck than ability, I'll be honest, more circumstance than ability. I've never really liked any of Gav Thorpe's writings. I just haven't. I just don't like them very much. Um... This one in this one is interesting though because it sets up it, it gives you an exploration of some of the internal politics of the Space Marine Legions at this point. So what Call of the Lion does is you get for the first time a clash with an an internecine clash within a legion. So you have the Dark Angels split down the middle. You've got the the Dark Angels that came from Terra before Caliban was rediscovered and the Calibanite commanders of the Dark Angels at odds with one another. And that is fascinating. The fact that these divisions were already occurring, totally without the influence of Chaos, by the way, these political and cultural divisions were already there. That's interesting. That is interesting. It's not great. It's not that essential really but it does it does explore some interesting elements of the internal politics now the next story the last church by graham mcneil is one of the more important stories in this collection um what the last church establishes for the one thing it's one of the very few stories that focuses almost exclusively on the emperor this is a story about the emperor of mankind and you get to see him as a protagonist in this story and it's not much i mean all it is is it's set before the Horus, way before the Horus Heresy, and kind of before the establishment of the Imperium as well. This is set on Terra long before the establishment of the Imperium, and it is es essentially what it says on the tin: the Emperor and his his unification armies arrive at the gates of the last church, the last temple on Terra, and most of the priests have fled. Most of them are gone because they know what the Emperor's regime does to priests. And there's only one priest left, and the, the entire story is just a philosophical and ideological discussion between the Emperor and this priest. It's quite good. I've got to say, it's quite good. Um, the argument doesn't go deep enough. It's not quite as expansive enough as it could be. This is not... Don't expect to come here and find a philosophical discussion that's incredibly deep or a metaphysical discussion that's incredibly deep. You're not going to get that. But it is interesting that this discussion is occurring in this setting. It really does establish this book, this short story, that this is... The Emperor's regime is not just secular, it's... it's, it's uh, it's tyrannical, it's despotic, it's oppressive. He is actually attempting to wipe out entire realms of human experience and um, consideration and inspiration. He wants this to be the last church and he wants there to be no more, not even discussion of metaphysics. It, I mean, it, it does explain a little bit of why he comes down so hard on the likes of the word bearers and the thousand sons. He wants that gone. He makes that very clear in this short story. What I find interesting is, although I would naturally, because of my own inclinations, usually side with the secularist in this, the priest's arguments are actually way better than the emperor's, and I like that rather a lot. He calls the emperor out, essentially. He calls the emperor out for just being a, a hypocrite who's just basically wants worship to come to him. He want, All he really wants to do is establish his own ideology that's absolute and unquestionable and will be uh, obviously mandated through force. That's what the, the priest says to him, and it's absolutely correct. Um, and it ends with the burning of the last church and the priest still inside. So yeah, this is introducing a wonderful bit of ambiguity. Um, the next story, after Deshea uh, by Matthew Farah, 
is again not essential but it's a very good story indeed because this leads into some of the stuff that happens later in the heresy this is this uh focuses on the warhounds and the warhounds are the world eaters they were called the warhounds before they were called the world eaters before they rediscovered angron on nuceria and this is the story of what happens when they do discover angron now for most of the other legions when they rediscover their primarchs it is this vast celebration they they uh, describe this metaphysical experience where upon setting eyes on their primarchs they know who they are they know what their place is they know what their purpose is and suddenly they're led by these incredible super beings who are highly intelligent and who restructure the legions and give them the essence of their own souls i suppose that doesn't happen here that doesn't happen for the warhounds when they find Angron, he's mad. He's beyond mad. In this story, he is sealed in the hold of the Conqueror, the, the, the flagship of the Warhounds, and he is rampaging. Whoever they send down there, he rips apart. He, he has killed any number of the World Eaters officers who have gone down to try and parlay with him. Um, and this is the story of Khan. Khan, who will become the betrayer, who is the only one who talks to Angron and can settle him. But it's also an internal look. You get an internal look of what Khan's feeling, which is this incredible sense of desolation. Because this was supposed to be the saving, the saving of their legion. This was supposed to be what made their legion like the others, you know, that put them on the same footing as the others didn't happen didn't happen whereas all of the other legions discovered primarchs who'd reconquered their worlds and turned them into these almost utopian ideals of course that didn't happen for angron they find this blood maddened violent berserker who can't eat, who can barely hold a cogent conversation um and it's khan who eventually eventually calms him down and who starts to build relations between the legion and the primarch it's actually a really good story this one well worth checking out not essential at all because all of this is actually told in backstory in the books that come later like betrayer but it is a good it's a it's a nice sort of intimate look of this moment where the warhounds uh the world eaters to be realize that their legion is never going to be like the others it's never going going to be in the same ascended place of the others so you kind of get the beginnings of their downfall here really it's um it's an interesting story as a whole the collection tales of heresy i uh, it's it's difficult to recommend unless you're an absolute purist unless you're a completionist and you want to read absolutely everything in this series largely it's kind of incidental. Like most of the short story collections in the Horus Heresy, it's a punctuation book. You can just skip over to the next novel in the series, to be honest. But it is diverting. By and large, it's well written. The stories are engaging and they introduce some nice bits of fluff, you know? Some nice bits of character and uh, stuff to get your teeth into. I, I like that element of them. They explore parts of the universe that maybe haven't been explored yet and introduce notions that haven't been introduced yet so yeah it's a worthwhile read it's just not essential if and you have to bear in mind there's a lot of reading to do in this series so if you are reading from beginning to end this might be one of those that you want to skip over just for brevity's sake um but yes when we get back ladies and gents we will have a look at the next novel in the series so until then bye bye <laughs>